Hey everybody, welcome to another online service with Court Street Christian Church. I'm Corey Spangler, the lead pastor here at Court Street, and welcome. Hey, we're living in really peculiar times, aren't we? I mean, the amount of things that keep happening, the amount of uncertainty in the world, the amount of fear, the amount of anxiety, it's really uh, an intense thing. And uh, I, uh, I discovered this week during my sermon research a statistic that the CDC published a few weeks ago, or excuse me, a few months ago, and uh, they had surveyed over 800,000 Americans this last Christmas, so about a year ago during the holiday season, and they were looking for what's happening with America in terms of our mental health. And here's one of the things that they discovered through that survey that they released earlier this year, is that more than two in five adults, about 42% of people at that time, were reporting symptoms of either anxiety or depression disorder. Now, I think all of us would raise our hands if we said, in the last year, have we felt anxious? Have we felt depressed? We all have, but they were specifically looking for what's happening with the, the clinical side of folks, where they're needing extra support to get through this time. And this is a staggering number. You know, um, we've uh, talked from time to time at this church about how the health trends here in America, especially mental health, is becoming uh, its own epidemic. And uh, anxiety, depressive disorders, and the resulting conditions, they were anticipated to become the leading cause of death for Americans um, sometime in the next 10 years. And it seems that the pandemic and all of the stress and anxiety and all of the depression and heartache created by it has only moved that date even closer. Well, um, we're in difficult times. And what do we do about difficult times? Do we batten down the hatches? Do we overstock our pantries with stuff? Do we hoard things? Do we just put our heads in the sand or just close our closet door and just try to pray it all away? Or is there another way to live? And that's what we're going to talk about these next few weeks is we're going to talk about what I believe is something that can push back against that overwhelming feeling that so many of us have of the depression, of the anxiety, of the hopelessness in the world. And uh, that thing is generosity. Generosity. And so we're calling our sermon series A Generous Life. Um, I want to be really careful as I talk about this too in light of those very personal subjects that I was just mentioning to say this. I don't say take the magic generosity pill and you should stop taking your anxiety or depression pills. You know, maybe over the course of time something like that happens. But what I'm saying is that there is a, a value that seems countercultural that seems like it doesn't make sense when we're hurting or feeling vulnerable to actually open our hearts and open our bank accounts to being more generous. But I believe that's exactly the life that God created us to live. In the pandemic, outside of the pandemic, everywhere, it's the best life, the generous life. And so we're going to talk about it. Hey, here's a... Uh, a, a statement that my spiritual director said to me recently. He was telling a story. He, he uh, as well as spiritual directing, he does some other things. One of them is he hosts a, a rather robust Airbnb environment. And he had a guest staying with him. And, uh, and he just noticed this guest in a really positive way. And uh, this guest and his, his other associates, he's like, he's like, man, there is something really special about your group as he just encountered him a bit over the days that they stayed with him. And he says, uh, he says to the guy, what is it about your group and about you? And the guy said to him this. He said, I like to surround myself with people who are, and can you guess what he said? Did he say like-minded? Did he say rich? Did he say agitated? Did he say people that just look like me? What he actually said that was revolutionary to uh, my spiritual director and just like, duh, of course, was he said, I like to surround myself with people who are generous. I like to surround myself with people who are generous. And for Ross, he just kind of stepped back in his life and he just thought to himself, that's so beautiful. If I surround myself with people who are generous, what's naturally going to well up in me? If I view God and the universe, if I'm surrounded in this great cloud of generosity, what's going to happen inside of my life? And that's what I want to invite you to today. You know, um, here at Court Street, one of the things that's easy for myself as a pastor, as an elder, and just as a member of the church to say, and that I love to just 
uh, tell stories about is the generosity of this church. We're always doing something. We're always dreaming up something new. We're always uh, hearing about a need and responding to it in some way. And uh, individually in the church, too, people are just living that out. It's not just when we come together, but it's all of us out there being the church, being generous. Uh, one of the stories uh, that took place during the pandemic that really touched my heart was um, I happened to be coming through the lobby at church when a couple had come in and they were just leaving. And I was like, oh, hey, what are you doing? How are you guys doing? And we kind of caught up for a little bit. And uh, just so you know, I don't uh, touch the money here at church. You know, I don't go around at the end of the service and collect from our offering boxes. And I don't, you know, do that stuff. There's, there's other folks at another place that encounters that. So it's rare that I have this type of an interaction, which I had with these folks, where they actually shared with me about their giving. And what they said was just so beautiful. They just said, you know, we just got this check from the government and you know our budget was already set and we already have enough and so we looked at this check and thought well we can stick it in the bank or do something with it but why don't we just go give it to the church I'm sure they'll find something to do in the community that will be worthwhile with it and I just love that that is not an uncommon story here of, of people that when they're getting more, they don't hoard more. In fact, they look and they go, well, I was blessed with this. Let me extend the blessing to other people. This is a generous church, and I love that. So what we're going to get in today in our inaugural sermon about a generous life, and we're going to talk about a lot of things in the next few weeks, but especially we're going to talk about money, and we're going to kind of re, um, reintegrate our souls with money. Sometimes we think those things should be separate, they're diametrically opposed to each other, but they should be partners that actually work hand in hand. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some different benevolent things we're doing. It's going to be a great go of it. But um, I want to start today, and I want to go through a passage of Scripture with you, okay? These are, these are very significant. In fact, probably the most um, celebrated teaching that Jesus ever did and most recognizable came from the Sermon on the Mount. And our passage today specifically is going to be in Matthew chapter 5, 38 to 48. We're going to look at these these words from Jesus, these very inspiring words, and, um, and I think they're going to open a fresh and deep well of generosity inside of each of us. So, Jesus is teaching, and this is really one of his first major, you know, we kind of call it sometimes his inaugural address. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago, a different part of it. I'm talking about it again today. It's worth talking a lot about, and today as we go through it, uh, I'm going to pause a lot. So we're going to go through it, and I'm going to play the interrupting, annoying pastor constantly. I'm not just doing that for my own amusement. I'm doing that to provide the pop of context. And that pop of context will let you feel, hopefully, some of the emotional gravitas of what, when Jesus said it to the people who were listening, what it would have stirred up inside of them. And hopefully it'll help you to make some connections to what it hopefully will stir up inside of us today. So here we go. From Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is talking. This is kind of mid-sermon here, and he says this. He's in this series where he's, uh, where he's kind of providing these contrasts. He's reprogramming people with a, a bigger vision for life, a bigger vision for God. And he says this, you have heard it said, nice approachable little phrase here, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now what he's actually doing here is he's, he's specifically quoting a snippet from their own law, their own Bible, if you will. It's from the, uh, the books of the law. And it was this phrase of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And like so many things, we as humans love to take little nuggets like this and we kind of put a different spin on it and we use it in a different manner than really what God intended. And if we look at the, the actual context of what this was written for and the times that it was written in, it was not meant to be something that said, if someone takes something from you, you take something from them. If they put one of yours in this, then you do one of that, and you get this, and da da, da. It wasn't this idea that was playing out. It was actually a term that, and a concept that was designed to limit the retribution of people onto one another. You see, 
at the time it was written, uh, it was written to the, the Jewish, the Hebrew people, and they were a nomadic people. They were getting this new identity fashioned by God that they were going to relate to the world in a more of the way that God designed people to relate to one another. And, uh, and he gave them this idea to interrupt the idea that if you offend me, then I go and I just punish you and maybe even punish your family. It was the, uh, the idea of retributive justice. Well, you killed one of my livestock, so I kill you, and things would just kind of escalate from there. And so he says, listen, you need to keep when somebody offends you or somebody steals something or somebody hurts you, you need to keep that limited to something that is more appropriate in the legal system. And so this was something that was meant to uh, actually keep people from harming one another, but in Jesus' day, just like ours, how do we use the phrase oftentimes? It actually becomes a, an excuse to go, well, the Bible says I should take an eye for an eye, so I should go and I should get my, you know, this whole kind of thing. And that's not the context at all. And context, church, is always so important because without it, we can make the Bible say whatever we want and justify all kinds of things that are actually against the Bible, and that's terrible. So, you see what I'm doing here. We're going to pause, we're going to look at this so that it really pops for us, and then we'll go back and we'll read it again. You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Let's tear off a whole bunch of scripture next before I interrupt again. Jesus says, but, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> so, uh, in Bible school, we would call this but, you know, the Latin phrase for what it's accomplishing is psychesis interruptus via budimus maximus. <laughs> Sorry, my middle school sense of humor is coming out. I hope you appreciate it. If you don't, ignore and just kind of keep going. But uh, here's the deal. Jesus is giving them this common phrase with a common understanding. Their psychology is like, do 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 we get this. In fact, we've decided God's authorized us to do this and da 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 but he puts in the big old but right there. And what does he say next? Something that starts to pull at our hearts and go, oh, that kind of feels scary. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but don't resist an evil person. Come on, Jesus. Like, that's a lot, isn't it? And was Jesus here saying, is this a new command where he's trying to say, you know, let evil people do whatever they want, whenever they want, and just pretend like it never happened. Stick your head in the sand. No, what he's saying, though, is he's calling out this idea of when people would label somebody evil, they would use scripture, like eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, to justify them retaliating against them. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Take a different approach. And I want to ask you this question, because Jesus is messing with our hearts here. Am I more interested in what's permissible? Well, it's permissible for me to go demand my rights, permissible for me to da, da, da. Or am I more interested in what's beneficial? Okay? I'm actually borrowing some language here from elsewhere in the scripture, the Apostle Paul, who drew this concept out really beautifully. But Jesus is, is poking at our heart value system and how we view God and how we justify things. And are things permissible? Yes. Is there times for, for certain things or you have to demand an accounting of this or that? Should we just let you know? You know all, all that kind of stuff. But am I more interested in what's permissible or what's beneficial? Jesus goes on. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Okay? Now, Violence isn't something that Jesus is condoning here. What he's talking about in the context of this for the people that would have heard it is they would have heard this as like this backhanded type slap, this little like uh, public insult that would take place. You know, the only thing I can think of that, you know, pops in my mind when I think about this is when people would go up to each other in the you know, old days and they'd take out their you know, their gloves and go, I challenge you to a duel, sir, publicly, and they slap them on the face like this, and then, you know, the fight starts after that sometime. Um, it's, it's kind of that thing. And I was thinking of this, and I was going, what's the common context for us today of what this type of a public offense would be? And uh, I think it's things like this. I think it's when somebody's talking a lot of trash about you on social media. I think it's when you get this obnoxious negative Google review that somehow has your name in it and you're like, man, this person just insulted me unjustly. They're just, they're, they're insulting me publicly, in fact. It may be the interdepartmental email 
or communication where somebody says some sly things that take a dig at you. And so it could be the neighborhood gossip. It could be a lot of things, but it's this, this public thing that's an affront to someone's character, and it's, and it's offensive to them, and it's difficult. So he's saying, if someone insults you, you know, you're probably quick to eye for an eye. I trade an insult back. We get that counterpunch, whatever. Remember, he's, he's deprogramming this. He goes on, if someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And Jesus is getting really countercultural here because at the time, unlike today where our clothing is, you know, we've got it everywhere. We've got, you know, all, all this stuff. We can go and we can, we can get it. Most of our closets are overflowing. Your clothing back then was a very precious commodity. In fact, this statement right here is also something that would have reminded them from something of their faith tradition and their laws. In fact, in their laws it said you couldn't ever take away someone's coat, their outer garment, because they would often sleep with it at night like it was a blanket. And so it was a way to actually preserve their life and stay warm. And so Jesus is pushing against that, and he's saying he's bringing them to this different awareness of how to respond in life. He says this, the pain actually increases with this next statement. It's about to get real from Jesus. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Okay? What's this about? Well, you can probably know this is where we get the idea of the common phrase, go the extra mile for something. Okay? Go the extra mile. It sounds like this good thing. Well, at the time of Christ and to the audience he was speaking to, this was, this was first century folks, and they were existing in a nation that was an occupied nation. They were part of the Holy Roman Empire, and they were subjects of that empire who had been conquered and were viewed as a class beneath those in the ruling class or those that were citizens of Rome. And one of the actual legal things that was, uh, that was known throughout the entire empire was that if a soldier from Rome could... Um, could kind of, a, 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 what's the term, commandeer. Could commandeer, you know, a, a person for labor, could commandeer some of their stuff for their own purposes. And there was a limit to it. They would say, you know, you've got to walk with uh, this Roman soldier if they want you to carry your, their shield or something like this, and you're going about your business, you've got to stop what you're doing, and you've got to go with them for a thousand paces or a mile, okay? That's, that's the unit of measurement. A thousand paces was about a mile. And so this was a terrible thing. This was something where it was like, hey, these people have more rights than us, and they can just come up to us at any time, and they can demand that we actually stop what we're doing, and we have to go with them a full mile. Everybody hated this, okay? The people in Jesus' audience, this would have been something that lit up their pain grid big time. Wait a minute. When we're oppressed, we should actually offer to be you know, more generous in that oppression, Jesus, you're kind of out to lunch here. This would have been kind of a uh, type, type moment to be listening in. And, you know, I want to, um, I want to pause here, and I just kind of want to ask, because this is a very personal section, people offending us, people that we perceive as evil, doing evil things, people even uh, oppressing us or demanding things of us or us feeling like we have less rights than other people. Jesus is really, is really pushing into us here. And I want to ask you this. When you, in your own thoughts, in your own mind, you know, kind of like that first, that first idea that we touched on, who are you surrounding yourself with? What are you surrounding yourself with inside of here? Are you the type of person, like me oftentimes, where I am just quick to go through life and to rehearse all the wrongs that have been done to me to as many people as can listen, okay? It's like I'm going through life looking to be offended, and then I'm like, great, I got the latest story that I could talk about with this person, or I could complain about when I get home, or I can call three different people and tell it three different ways, and each time it gets more dramatic with how much I was offended, or am I the type of person that likes to focus my attention and thoughts are my attention on thoughts that are generous, okay? See, Jesus is breaking the stride of the typical human psychology, breaking the stride of the typical ways we use things from the Bible to justify us, saying things that really aren't helpful, they're really not beneficial. 
In fact, they're really just kind of keeping, well, you offended me, so I offend you back, and they're keeping this kind of back and forth thing alive. And Jesus is interrupting that with this ethic and this perspective of God and generosity. So he goes on. Here's what he says. He says, give to the one who asks you, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And uh, at their time, this probably would have been something of like, if somebody needs something and they're asking for it, you know, that's something that they might have looked down on, that person's being needy, whatever, or borrowing, being in debt. In this sermon series, we'll talk a bit about being in debt, and there's huge differences for what it means today than what it meant back then. Being in debt could trigger uh, being, in, being imprisoned or even being enslaved. And so there was a lot at stake here. And so these, are, again, Jesus is poking at things that they normally would resist, not saying, well, you should do this instead, but expanding their perspective. He also says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That makes sense to them, didn't it? It was just kind of apparently a common phrase at the time. And, um, and it's sort of a common mentality today, even though we don't necessarily admit it all the time, do we? He says this, but I tell you, okay? Remember, he's, you've heard this. This makes sense to you. But I'm telling you, I'm inviting you to this deeper understanding that you should love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, this is a personal question for me, what I'm about to share with you, because I am very passionate about justice and very passionate about injustice. But sometimes the priorities in my life shift to where I'm more concerned about that than I am about the love of God. And what Jesus is doing here is he's inviting us to questions like this. Am I more interested in the scales of justice or in the generosity of God? Which one's the primary? Because if this is primary, this will flow from it in a really beautiful way, won't it? But if this is primary, and I'm counting and dishing out the retribution, and I'm just living here, uh, this starts to go bye-bye, doesn't it? It really does. Jesus goes on, why all this? What about all this stuff that he's talking about? What's at stake here? And he says, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. This name of God, the generous God, the benevolent God, you're actually his kids if you're living out that name, if you're living out that reality. And uh, what Jesus is going to do next is he, he, would often, um, he would often poke at very personal areas and he would insert these very difficult things to live out but that were very beautiful. And then he would kind of just reassure people with some common okay, we get that type stuff, okay? And, uh, and this next one, what he says is he says, he, he, he causes, meaning God, the sun to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And at that time, just like today, sometimes we forget that that's the world that we're living in, is that it's not just the people who have done bad things that experience bad things. And it's not just the people that are, do good things that experience good things. That there's actually things happening in the world right now and sometimes good people suffer. And sometimes people that seem like they're really just terrible, they get ahead. The sun's shining and the rain's falling and that's just the way that it is in this world. And he says this to him. he says, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? He says, are not even the tax collectors doing that? <laughs> and Truth be told, in the big group that Jesus was sharing this message with, there was probably some tax collectors. <laughs> so you can imagine Jesus being like, isn't it obvious the tax collectors who at the time were known for being uh, somewhat corrupt and taking advantage of their people, he's like, you love those who love you. Uh, what, what reward is that for you? Even tax collectors do that. They tax the people they like less and the people they don't like more. In fact, Maybe in the group, people were like, if you don't stop looking at us, we'll tax you more. Like, get on with it, Jesus. You know, and he goes on to say this. He says, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. You see, we like to think sometimes that we're just nice, benevolent people, don't we? And we're like, well, I love the people who I, I love, and I greet people in a friendly way. They're mostly people that greet me also. And I complain about people that I don't like. And, I, and the people that are really bad, I, I really try to do bad things or hope and pray bad things over them. And Jesus is poking at all that and helping them to see that, man, 
that's really not a heavenly value system there. Even people that, you know, he's not insulting pagans here, but he's just saying even people that have no regard for God, they just think that this life happens and then it's over, the light switches out and that's the end of it. Even they greet people that greet other, that greet them as well. And so he's saying, duh, there's got to be something bigger and what I'm telling you is that bigger. And he concludes this little section with this statement. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Is this about spotless imperfection? The perfection that Jesus is talking about here is more maturity. Grow up in this. Become mature in love. Become mature in generosity, just as your heavenly Father is mature and generous and perfect in that. That's how you're to relate, okay? So, here's the deal. We just got through it. You just got a whole lot of context, some history. You got some personal connection to what this might mean inside of our hearts and lives for today. And I want to give you just kind of a summary statement of this is super important for just understanding what Jesus is doing and why it's so important is commands. If Jesus has just given them a bunch of commands, well, really what those are is they're just demands for a specific response. Okay? That's all they are. It's like programming a computer. And they were looking at their laws, their history, from that perspective. Looking for ways to justify themselves. Looking for the commands. Well, I was just doing this or whatever. But Jesus is inviting them to values. Values that inspire new realities. In fact, earlier, Jesus mentions in this very speech, he says, I might think I'm coming to abolish the law, the prophets, all these things that we hold dear, the foundation, all that. I'm not. I'm coming to fulfill them. The commands aren't going to fulfill them, okay? But if you live within these heavenly values like God, you'll actually end up fulfilling the commands. It's a bigger, broader, more integrated way to live. You know, a few years back, um, I, uh, I was summoned to the home of a family in the church where the, the dad was, was dying of cancer. His name was Chuck Baker, and uh, I was early in ministry. I was the youth pastor at the time, and uh, some of Chuck's grandkids were actually in my youth ministry, and the lead pastor had been over to visit with them, and then he was somewhere else, and he just said, oh, man, on this day, would you go check in with the family and just pray with them? And So I go out to their house. They had this beautiful property right off of uh, Highway 22, just heading out east of Salem a little ways, and Chuck and his wife Margie, they had this... Uh, this great property, and, and there was uh, this, this small nursery that Margie ran there called Margie's Gardens. And they were this, this very endearing couple, and they had these kids and all these grandkids. And um, I go to, to Chuck's house knowing that he's dying of cancer, and when I walk in, what I walk into is this amazing celebration. Everybody's just gathered around uh, Chuck's uh, hospital bed, which is right there in the main area of the house. And Chuck was just this generous person. He was one of these folks who was generous with his words. He was generous with his praise. He was generous with his time. He was generous with his money and his stuff. He was somebody that just really exuded this generosity of God that I believe Jesus is inviting us to the deep water of. And uh, I walked in kind of prepared that it was going to be this somber thing, and everybody's celebrating. Everybody's gathered around Chuck's hospital bed telling stories. And Chuck, even though his physical body is ailing and he'd pass away just shortly after this, he uh, was like leaning out of his hospital bed and, and he's saying all, you know, telling all these stories. And they, they, everybody was laughing. It was just this, this beautiful scene to be a part of. And I'm talking, I'm interacting, and I led everybody in a prayer and and uh, I said something to one of, the, one of his sons. I was like, man, your dad is just so full of life. And he's like, yeah, my dad's just always been like that. And he, he told me a story. He said, you know, one time, he goes, my dad went to sell a car. And when he went to sell the car, uh, he was going over it with the guy and telling about all the things he'd done to it. And the guy drove off with the car. And, uh, and Chuck realized when he got home that the guy hadn't paid him. <laughs> and uh, just a minor oversight, right? And Chuck's attitude about it was, well, he probably needed the car more than I did. And for me, 
a young man early in life, you know, and early, you know, early in my career at the time, every penny was very precious. I mean, I thought to myself, I felt the feels in that moment of like, if somebody took a car and didn't pay me for it, I would go find that person and I would make sure they paid every cent plus interest. But Chuck's generosity interrupted the command structure. It interrupted the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth that so naturally comes to me and to all of us, doesn't it? And there was this different just kind of aroma in the air. It was the aroma of generosity and it felt lighter and it felt better and it was like, I hope I'm the type of guy someday that lives a generous life just like that. So, the context, the life of Chuck, this whole idea of generosity and benevolence. Now let's go back and let's savor the words of Jesus, and I hope they really pop for you as they have for me this week. You've heard it said. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Someone slaps you on your right cheek. Turn to them the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and to take your shirt, even Uh, Also, just hand over to them your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven, your Father in heaven who causes the sun to rise on the evil as well as the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you just love those who love you, what reward is that? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I um, encountered a great story uh, told by a, a poet and a mo- just kind of an inspirational speaker and author that I like to listen to, and um, his name is David White, and he was telling this story of um, this great friendship that he enjoyed with another poet, philosopher, and author named John O'Donohue. And uh, these two guys, uh, John also was a, uh, was a Catholic priest as well. And these two guys just developed this amazing connection and because both of them uh, dabbled in the, the philosophical and they worked in the poetic and being authors and this sort of thing, um, they just had all of this common ground, but they, just, they had this uh, wonderful friendship where they could talk about everything and they could talk about nothing together. You know, and a, a friendship is just like that. And it's so easy to move between silliness and seriousness and uh, David and John O'Donohue were, uh, were bonded in that special way. And one day, um, they're sitting down, and uh, they're discussing something, and all of a sudden, David brings up uh, that uh, he's thinking about loaning his father, um, uh, giving his father some money, actually. And uh, John O'Donohue says, oh, really, how much are you thinking of giving him? And, um, and David says, well, I'm thinking about giving him a 1000 and uh, without even much of a pause, John just says, David, go beyond yourself. Go beyond yourself. Make it 2,000. And David says, thinks about it for a second. He's kind of taken aback. And he says, okay, I guess I'll, that's true. I could go beyond myself. I'll make it 2,000. And then as soon as he agrees to that, John O'Donohue says, David, go beyond yourself again. Make it 4,000. And, David, and David's like, okay, settle down. Okay, uh, let me think about it. You know? That might actually be a good thing to go beyond myself. And so he ended up um, making this great uh, donation to his father who needed money. And uh, it ended up being this moment for him where what he found after the fact in hindsight was instead of just meeting his father's need, he had gone beyond that, which that would have been generous enough, wouldn't it? But he'd be gone beyond that to this place of abundant generosity. And what that actually did, um, what David saw took place in his dad's life, was that it actually broke a cycle of just barely getting enough to get by. Barely getting enough to get by. And then borrowing a little bit more to get by. 
all of a sudden he had this abundance that wasn't even asked for, that wasn't deserved, and it propelled him into a more healthy and generous way to live. Uh, I've got this question for you, church. This question for you, the last thing that I want you to really consider today is this. Am I more interested in preserving myself, my nest egg, my assets? Am I more interested in counting things out, measuring things out, or going beyond myself and giving beyond myself? You know, uh, a year after they had that encounter, uh, David and John were interacting again, and uh, they were talking, and, and John had completely forgotten about their previous conversation from a year ago, and so he's, they're talking, and all of a sudden he says to David, he says, you know, I've got this friend, I'm thinking about uh, giving her $500. And uh, David remembered how he had upped the ante for him a year before, and so he says, he says oh, really? And he says, uh, he says, uh, why don't you go beyond yourself and make it a full thousand? And John stops, and he kind of looks down, and he remembers the old conversation, and he goes, oh boy, this means I'm going to be into it for a full 4,000, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, it was, um, it was sadly not too long after that, just a few years, that uh, John O'Donohue's life uh, was cut short by cancer. And uh, he had just really started to achieve some uh, acclaim and recognition, and his poetry and his, his speaking was going mainstream, and, and cancer robbed him of, of that uh, influence increasing, and robbed David of that, uh, of that friendship continuing to develop. But uh, part of the way that David honored his friend is he, he looked at that interaction and how powerful it was for himself, and he wrote a poem that I'm going to share with you. And I really appreciate David White's poetry because a lot of it uh, is very soul-felt, very intelligent, but it's incredibly, incredibly approachable and incredibly practical. And so um, maybe you're not a fan of poetry, but I think you'll find something good in this. So let's look at this, that encounter and what it inspired, this poem, Just Beyond Yourself. Just Beyond Yourself, he says, it's where you need to be. Half a step into self-forgetting and the rest restored by what you'll meet. Forgetting the counting and having that actual faith that you're trusting God, the universe, others, the benevolence of the very creation, because it's created in the image of God, it'll be restored, it'll be okay. We can be generous. So half a step into self-forgetting and the rest restored by what you meet, there is a road always beckoning to us. And when you see the two sides of it, closing together at that far horizon, when you see this, this vision or something on the, and you feel deep in the foundations of your own heart exactly at that same time, this pull, that's how you know it's where you have to go. It's the way you have to go. That's how you know it's the road that you have to follow. And that's how you know it's just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. Well, we've covered some good ground today. At least I hope it's stirred up some goodness and awareness and just excitement about the generosity of God and that we get to live our best life is a generous life in a pandemic, outside of a pandemic, whether we're suffering, whether we're going through cancer, whether we're flying high on, the, on the, just the, the winds of success or blowing in our sails and we're just feeling great. The generous life is the best life. It's the life that Jesus modeled for us, and it is deep water. It is that horizon. It is that feeling in ourselves. It's scary. It's terrifying, but it's, it's inviting. It is, my friends, the only way to live. Let me bow my heart and bow your hearts with me, if you would, in a word of prayer. Our generous Heavenly Father, um, thank you for these convicting, interrupting, even a little bit offensive words of Jesus about, about what it looks like to really live generous in our everyday lives. God, I pray that uh, today we'd be inspired to not count what we're leaving behind or what it might cost us, but to just count it pure joy to get to participate in the miracle, the healing miracle of generosity. Lord, there's no other way to live, and as we look at this topic, and as we turn it over and look at it from different directions the next few weeks, 
would you inspire it to be more than a conversation, but inspire it to truly be a way of life for each of us that when people look at us, they would go, I want to surround myself with that kind of person, a generous person. It brings the best out of life and brings the best out of me, and it really showcases who God truly is. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in the good name of Jesus, who's been so generous to us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to leave you with a, uh, a compilation of some of the words from today, just to kind of leave them sweet inside of your ears here. Here we go. Just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. Half a step into self-forgetting, and the rest will be restored by what you'll meet. I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute and oppress or harass or bother you. Then, then you'll be true sons and daughters of your generous Father in heaven. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That type of generous life, that maturity, it's its own reward, isn't it? Hey, we'll continue the conversation next week. See you then.